Hello, everyone, and happy Earth Day. Welcome to our Clean Water Wednesday webinar series. We're really excited to be able to offer these webinars to our monitors, our friends, and the clean water community as a chance to learn about clean water issues and stay connected during these strange times. I am Rebecca Shore. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Save Our Streams Coordinator for the Isaac Walton League of America. I have a few quick housekeeping items to review before I turn things over to Zach, who will introduce our first presenter. First, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on the Isaac Walton League YouTube channel soon. Keep an eye on our website at iwla.org for information about the recording, and you'll also get a follow-up email that includes the link to the recording. Also, be sure to keep an eye on our upcoming webinars. Uh, we're having them every week for the next few weeks at least, so definitely keep an eye out. We have some really cool topics that will be coming down the pike soon. Second, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type them and send them in to the GoToWebinar chat box. We're going to have time for a Q&A at the very end um, of the webinar, so after both our presenters go. And the webinar should run for about an hour total. That'll include time for the question and answer session. All right, now I'm going to turn things over to Zach Moss, who is our Save Our Streams coordinator for the Midwest, and he's going to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, like, like Rebecca mentioned, I'm the Save Our Streams coordinator at the Isaac Walton League um, in the Midwest. I live in Clive, Iowa, actually, um, which is convenient because our first speaker is from Clive, Iowa, or he works in Cl for the city of Clive. Um, we have Doug Olandike. He's the Community Development Director with the City of Clive. Um, the City of Clive is a suburb of Des Moines in central Iowa, and Doug's going to discuss uh, some of the threats that the city um, and its residents are, are facing from Walnut Creek, which runs through most of the length of the city, um, and then some of the things that the city is, is trying to do to help remedy those, those situations, as well as uh, working with some partners to help remedy those situations. So. Um, making use of their, their green spaces and their um, resources available to them as a city. Uh, I listened to a presentation that Doug gave last fall at a Citizen Water Academy here in Des Moines, and he had a lot of great stuff to share. So I hope you guys are all able to take something away from this, and I'm going to pass it off to Doug now. Go ahead. Good morning. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate uh, everybody taking a few minutes to, to let me talk about Clive's water story. Uh, the city of Clive is generally a small but rapidly growing suburb that has uh, had a long-standing relationship with water. We've developed along the Walnut Creek, which, as Zach said, really does run right through the middle of our community. Uh, the community itself was incorporated in 1956 uh, as an approximately two-mile, two-square-mile rural town in the middle of Iowa, uh, about 700 people. And it was situated along a railroad, a gravel county road, and Walnut Creek. The significance of the railroad has diminished over the last 50 years that, that we've existed. And the old county road has been converted to uh, what is now a, an urban street network. However, Walnut Creek is still a defining element of what the city, of what makes the city of Clive so unique and special. And as you can see, um, our tagline is distinct by nature. So just a little context uh, for those that aren't familiar with the city of Clive. Uh, we are a suburb on the western side of the city of Des Moines, which is the capital city for the state of Iowa. Uh, the community, again, is about 20,000 people. Uh, we expect to be fully built out in about 10 years with a total population of about 25,000 people. Uh, the Des Moines metro area as a whole is about 650,000 people, and it's continuing to experience growth in many different sectors. Digging in a little deeper, uh, the city of Clive is located within the Walnut Creek watershed. Uh, you can see there, it's not a huge watershed, about 53,000 acres, uh, but it is somewhat complex in that we have nine communities, nine growing suburban communities or the city of Des Moines itself within the watershed. Uh, we do cross two county lines um, which, again, isn't all that problematic, except for in Iowa, uh, we've only really recently gotten into a phase in which we're looking at water as a water resource, 
uh, and looking at it from a watershed perspective, uh, where previously it, it really was everybody uh, to themselves trying to figure this thing out. And although we're working towards a one water approach, the legislative tools uh, really haven't caught up with that mindset yet in Iowa. We currently have the ability to organize into watershed management authorities, which those nine communities and two counties have done for Walnut Creek. Uh, the interesting part is we have the ability to organize, but from a legislative or, or regulatory framework, we can have the authority, but the authority has no actual authority. So um, we continue to follow the traditional Iowa model in which um, most regulatory controls are ceded over to an idea of voluntary cooperation. So we have this group, we're organized around the Walnut Creek watershed, we're actively communicating and working to make things better. Um, but at this particular point, each community is really the, uh, the driving focus on uh, actually making any improvements happen. A couple of key pieces about the watershed from Clive's perspective. The community represents about 10% of the land area within the watershed, but we have about 92% of the flows coming through the middle of our city uh, from the watershed. Obviously that uh, is pretty significant in the situation where uh, we get hit by the impacts, but don't necessarily have the ability to um, solve all the problems. The other part is the flooding conditions have become significantly uh, more impactful, more frequent over the last two decades. We're experiencing uh, moderate or, or mid-sized flooding events about every third year now. Uh, the damages associated with those types of events are about a million and a half to $3 million, both public and private. Uh, uh, property impacts. We um, The other big key for, for Walnut Creek is, although we're seeing these kind of moderate floods occur mo more frequently, we haven't seen the big one yet. Uh, the biggest we've seen along Walnut Creek is about a 40-year flood. Uh, so the big one's still out there uh, as we talk. It's uh, really not a question of uh, if it shows up, it, it really is just a question of when. So just wanted to give you a little sense of uh, what we're contending with here in, in Walnut Creek. Generally, our little 40 foot wide, two foot deep meandering creek is shown in the picture. Um, it's a great resource. We've built a, a large park and recreation system around it. Uh, unfortunately, that little quaint creek turns into a raging river on occasion. And again, that's occurring a little more frequently. So this is, uh, again, not a significant flood. This is about a 25-year flood. So uh, again, something we're seeing on about the every third, uh, certainly every third or fourth year basis. Uh, that 40-foot wide thing turns into a couple hundred foot wide uh, raging river uh, through the middle of our community. In this particular case, it's, it's through a Greenbelt Park, so not a lot of specific damage, but just wanted to give you a sense of uh, uh, what we're dealing with. The other part of it is, uh, again, although this was mostly open space area, uh, we have developed as a community along this, this creek, and we have about 250 buildings within the flood plain. And this represents about 10% of the city's total tax base is within uh, areas that are uh, subject to flood risk. So again, it's a pretty big issue for us uh, in terms of how we manage both today and think about what the future looks like for our community. So because we have these uh, increasing flood risk, and since we have not really seen the big one yet, uh, people have a, a real trouble understanding the urgency and the potential impact that uh, large flooding events may have our, on our community. Again, we've kind of gotten used to the idea of flooding every couple of years, um, but again, what we what we have not experienced is the big one. So fortunately, uh, we've had a lot of opportunity to work with some great partners, uh, federal partners in this particular case, to really examine uh, more of the flood risk potential. So we've looked at and analyzed what does a build-out condition look like in our watershed, 
what is the flooding potential and risk look like if we continue to do the status quo with how we, we work with water within this resource area. And we were able to put together uh, simulation or modeling that'll help people understand what the impact is. Uh, that previous video was really from the bridge that circled on the photograph and it was looking uh, upstream this particular simulation is really from that same vantage point, but looking downstream into uh, the developed portion of the of this area of the watershed. And again, that's about the flood level that we've seen. And that's what it's gonna be in the future if we continue to develop out the watershed and we experience a large 100-year flood event. And again, uh, just trying to help people get a better understanding uh, and appreciation for the fact that uh, we have to continue to be vig vigilant. We continue to have to have appropriate uh, strategies in place. We need to plan for, and ultimately we need to look at solutions where this doesn't uh, cause the amount of damage that it looks like it does in this photograph. So how can we continue to live with with Walnut Creek, but doing it in a way that we are much more resilient to it. We know it's gonna flood, we manage the flood condition, we limit the amount of property damage, we limit the amount of risk for human life, we clean up the next day, and we kind of move on, is kind of the, the hope for the community on the long-term basis. So most of our interest is uh, really about having too much water, but um, we also have issues with water quality as well. There's still areas uh, in the upper portion of the watershed that are agricultural based. And with that, we're experiencing some pretty significant nitrate levels coming into the watershed, into the urbanizing areas. Uh, but on the other side, we also have uh, some pretty significant E. coli levels that are occurring in the urbanized portions of the watershed. So. Um, we have both water quality and, and water quantity concerns. The issue with water quality uh, for us is really twofold. We, we do very much want to reconnect people with Walnut Creek, allow them to, to get out and play, uh, to allow for uh, families to enjoy that resource, whether it's fishing or uh, paddling or, or whatever it might be. Uh, the other side of it is the Walnut Creek uh, dumps into North, uh, into Raccoon River which is right at the intake gallery for the Des Moines Waterworks uh, plant, which is providing the domestic water for a large portion of the metro area. So the water quality uh, component is real uh, in terms of that, that potential impact as well. The beauty of the issue is uh, for us, and, and the way we think about it is the water quality and the water quantity improvements can really go hand in hand. Uh, we know that if we're able to uh, work on project areas where water quality is really the focus, uh, we know that that is gonna have an impact on hydrology and hydraulics within the watershed. So uh, our approach, although is primarily focused in, in flood issues, uh, we are leveraging those water quality improvements as well to create those co-benefits. And that's really where, where we're going as a community. Um, we started connecting the dots and putting together the idea of water quantity, water quality, flood mitigation, uh, uh, resource utilization about 10 years ago. Um, mostly it was because the city was required to get a, a national stormwater permit, the MS4 permit. And over those uh, last 10 years uh, from having that permit, we've really looked for ways to one, um, do the best we can within that regulatory framework. We're required to do activities, so let's do them the best we can. But we also started to get smarter, a little more educated, and we saw the linkage between those components within the permit and those other things that are important to the city of Clive, the Greenbelt Park, the Walnut Creek, the quality of life for our community. We, we finally kind of had the light bulb moment that uh, really it all comes down to being a better steward, a better manager of our water resource. That also uh, came with the uh, the recognition, the realization that 
we are as a community again about eight or ten percent of the land area within the watershed and that we can't fix the problems ourselves um, we know and and have come to the realization that we have to have partners it's going to require change in mindset from uh, kind of preservation of each community, if you will, and really getting to a point of individual responsibility, both from a community standpoint as well as a property owner standpoint. And it's going to require a lot of leadership. And that's really where the city of Clive is, is uh, decided to be. We decided that uh, in order to give people comfort, to give them the idea that this can be done, we as a community are going to lead the Walnut Creek watershed. So we explore, we experiment, uh, we push, we prod, we beg, uh, we borrow, uh, sometimes steal, I guess, uh, but we do whatever we can to uh, show people that this is something that can be accomplished if we just put our mind to it. So I uh, don't have a ton of time, but I wanted to talk about a couple of the specific elements that um, uh, we've been working on that are kind of cool. I'm going to chat uh, a little bit about some stormwater management stuff, um, healthy soils, which we think is really important, stream bank stabilization, uh, which is another really important part for, for our community. And then la last but not least, uh, uh, one of the cool things we just started working on is uh, called a Green Belt GOAT program. So I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Stormwater management, a critical element. We are, uh, again, a fast growing suburban community. We're adding about 400 acres of impervious surface area within our watershed each year with the development that's occurring. Uh, our past practices have really been on, on uh, large flood management controls with those BMPs. Again, as we've gotten a little smarter, uh, we have gotten to the understanding that it's not just about large rain events. Yes, flooding is critical. But we know that those large or those smaller rain events that are occurring more frequently are causing quite a bit of damage and destruction to our receiving channels, into the smaller tributaries, and then ultimately into Walnut Creek. The volume and the rate of the runoff that is going into those systems is at a sufficient level where it is just unraveling and substantially altering the geomorphology of those of those receiving areas. So we know that we needed to get a handle on that. We know we needed to get to a point where those developments needed to occur. That's kind of our lifeblood of growth of a community, but we needed to find a way to do that uh, such that it's not having adverse impacts downstream. So we've moved away from the old methods and old techniques of modeling. Uh, we're getting to a point where we're, we're trying to do more uh, stormwater management where the raindrop falls on the site. Uh, rather than stacking it up and trying to do uh, large system-wide improvements uh, downstream or flood control projects, let's do a better job individually with the sites. And we've done that. We've kind of moved to that middle space where we're, we're thinking a little more holistically, a little more regionally based, a little more infiltration based. Uh, but we do have another couple steps in my mind that we need to get to. So we need to be thinking of these things as multi-beneficial. Uh, solutions that are adding value to the community. Next big issue, soil. Uh, Iowa has got great soil, but uh, in the development landscape, uh, it's it's just thought of as another, another component to the development. So we have situations where uh, there's very little topsoil left on sites. Uh, people throw sod on top of it, and you know, as you can see, We've been in, in rain events where you can just peel the sod back because it's more or less sitting on what is compacted soil that's functioning like concrete. We've been moving towards uh, better protecting through the development process, but then also mitigating and managing healthy soil profile on development sites, uh, integrating compost and ensuring that the organic matter and the bulk density is, is appropriate. We also see, again, moving beyond that, where we've got a lot of the landscape that uh, could use to have some soil quality restoration, decompacting those spaces, adding organic content uh, will go a long way to having that soil be a giant sponge for us within the watershed. We, we have uh, 
over 25 miles of stream bank in our city, and uh, most of them are uh, significantly or at least moderately impacted. Uh, eight, 10 foot vertical banks are, are not uncommon, as you can see on some of these photos. So uh, we have a lot of spaces where we're, we're having the conflict with our, our infrastructure. So we are going in and reworking projects. Uh, we're getting away from simply dumping riprap or concrete or whatever else we can find on the side of the street into the creeks, moving away from that. Uh, again, looking at it a little more holistically, looking at it as more of a systems approach uh, to how can we get multiple benefits from these projects. Uh, just a few examples of, of some of the projects that we've done along Walnut Creek. In conjunction with these projects, we are pairing them with constructed wetlands, oxbow restorations, native plantings in the repairing areas, and, and really trying to involve the community in a much broader uh, reach, whether or not it's education or actual volunteerism through the planting processes. And then uh, the last one is our newest adventure. Uh, we are in the gr Greenbelt goat business. Um, we have a lot of acres of riparian floodplain space that's under the city's ownership in the community. But up to this point, we've really taken a hands-off approach, let Mother Nature do her thing with those. Again, as we've become more educated, uh, we are looking at how those floodplain spaces can more, more adequately function or more efficiently function. Part of that problem is that it's been overrun with invasive materials, invasive plants, and that's jeopardizing or impacting the, the quality of the forest canopy. It's, it's impacting the uh, deep rooted vegetation that was once in those spaces. It's also having an impact on the vegetation that's holding uh, some of our stream banks uh, together. Those are being lost and then the banks are unraveling even more. So we've, uh, we've decided to uh, uh, enlist a few friends, uh, a herd in fact of uh, goats and we've been using goats within the greenbelt spaces to eat up all of those invasive materials. And uh, we've been doing that for about two years now. And it's really been uh, fascinating and, and certainly interesting to see uh, their capabilities and uh, really is actually making a pretty significant impact. We've, we've had some folks that uh, are in the professional vegetation management business continue to do some assessment of, of the work that we've done and in that 18 months, um, you know, it's it's been nice to hear that we've taken some of those spaces from what they would call a grade of D, and we've bumped that up to a grade of C with a little active management and, and help from our friends here. So we're excited to be able to continue this program. Uh, we think it's a it's a great way to again kind of connect some of the natural resources together. Um, and the goats have really become kind of the city's mascot, if you will. The goodwill that's been created uh, has really been priceless for us. So overall, um, we kind of look at our water resources a little differently now. Uh, this is an old Vince Lombardi quote uh, concept. Perfection is not obtainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. And that's really how we're thinking about uh, how these resources work for the city. We're, we're not going to be able to turn back the clock. We don't have the resources to do that. But this kind of situation is uh, something that we shouldn't be satisfied with living with. Uh, we do know and do believe firmly that if we uh, put in the effort, we connect the dots, we bring all the parties to the table, we create this new shared sense of responsibility that we can get here. We can catch excellence. Uh, I truly believe that once we move past that question, of whether or not we're going to be in the water resource management business, not just as a regulator or a permit holder, but truly as a manager of a business, we can turn our attention and efforts to the job of getting it done in the most valuable, and most value added and most efficient manner. I am very, very hopeful that uh, we're not quite there, but uh, I am hopeful that we'll be able to catch excellence here in the next uh, few years. Thanks for your time and I look forward to any questions. Great, thank you so much, Doug. And yeah, definitely um, keep those keep those questions coming. Um, we'll go through as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So feel free to keep typing those in and submitting them. And um, yeah, we look forward to having some nice engagement um, after Tracy's presentation. 
So next up, I'm going to introduce Tracy Rouleau, who is our second presenter, and she is president of the Muddy Branch Alliance, which is in Maryland. And Ms. Rillo focuses on getting the community out to enjoy the stream and improve water quality through local stream monitoring and policy efforts in Montgomery County. She's the lead for the annual Summer Paddle on the Potomac, and she also encourages local students to participate in stewardship activities. She's involved in lots of different organizations, including serving as the co-chair of the Montgomery County Water Quality Advisory Group and serving on the board of the of the Gaithersburg Parks, Arts, and Recreation Corporation and working with local policy advocacy groups. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Tracy and she's going to talk to us about the Muddy Branch Alliance and their work working for clean water with local residents. There we go, unmuted. Yep, sorry about that. Um, can you see my screen? Yep, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you, Rebecca, um, and to the Isaac Walton League for having me here to speak with you this afternoon. Um, I, I did want to um, send a big shout out to the Isaac Walton League. Um, they are great partners of ours. Um, we've worked with them for um, most of the past nine years. Um, you all may know, may or may not know that the Isaac Walton League headquarters is located in Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is where I live um, and where the Muddy Branch watershed is. Um, our stream runs right through their property and our trailhead um, is basically starts in their back parking lot. So um, I appreciate everything that you all do um, uh, for clean water. Um, Uh, who am I? Um, well, Rebecca told you most of it. Um, I'm a mom of two boys. Um, I put my boys' pictures up uh, largely because it's because of them that um, I sort of do all a lot of what I do locally. I want, um, we spend a lot of time wandering on the stream, um, spending time out there. You know, they grew up playing in the water, catching crayfish, playing with the dog. And so, um, you know, they're the reason that um, I'm very interested in making sure that we have clean um, water for um, families in our in our community to play in. Um, I, I'm the president of the Muddy Branch Alliance, and that um, is a local watershed group, and that's sort of the hat I'll be wearing today. Um, Rebecca also pointed out some of the other things um, that I do. Um, I'm also um, the president of an environmental economics consulting firm. Um, I was very interested in um, Doug's presentation, um, I actually work to value ecosystem services, um, specifically natural infrastructure um, and climate adaptation efforts, flood reduction benefits, that sort of thing. So um, that's what I sort of do for a living. Um, I've also um, done some time, um, quote unquote, time at EPA um, and NOAA. Um, so who's the Muddy Branch Alliance? Muddy Branch Alliance is an all volunteer partnership of local citizens. Um, we're watershed stewards, we're community advocates, um, we really try to uh, keep the waters of our watershed clean. Um, we try to get people out in the trail um, and really want our community to recognize that there's a beautiful park and an 11 mile trail um, that's right in folks' backyards, um, get them to love it and so that they'll help to take care of it. Um, you'll see um, most of our uh, logo is always applied with Watts Branch Watershed Alliance and the Seneca Creek Watershed Partners. Seneca Creek is the watershed to our north. Watts Branch is the watershed to our south. Um, and since we're all um, connected, um, we work very closely um, together. Um, this being Earth Day, happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, it's that time of year we produce our annual report and normally have an annual meeting. Um, this essentially is a summary of um, what the Muddy Branch um, Alliance has accomplished. You can see up in the upper uh, left-hand corner, um, we work best with partners, um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, faith groups. We have a great relationship with the city of Gaithersburg and are very grateful for that. Um, and, and we do a lot of different things. We have um, been in existence for nine years. We have over 800 members. Um, we plant a lot of trees. We've done uh, planted 2,718 trees um, so far, um, we maintain a, the, help maintain the trail um, that runs from the Isaac Walton League all the way down to the Potomac River um, in Maryland. 
um, 4,200 people. We did a trail monitoring exercise last year and found that over 4,200 people um, use the trail. Um, we get people out on the trail th through bike events, through Vokes marches, which is people's marches. It's essentially organized hike hikes. We do uh, trail work, uh, weed warrior events, um, every month, and then certainly um, we have extra events throughout the year. We did 16 uh, Weed Warrior events in 2019. Um, as Doug pointed out, we're largely remo removing invasives um, and repairing the trails due to flood damage. Um, we unfortunately use human labor instead of goats, but I do like the idea of goats, so um, I appreciate it. I'll start thinking about that. Um, on the bottom left hand corner, you'll see the Lands Green Waters Clean program. Um, and that's what I'll basically spend uh, most of my time talking about. Um, we're also, of course, on social media. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram, um, or you can visit our website at um, www.muddybranch.org. Um, sorry about that. Um, so here's the Muddy Branch. Um, this is just a map that we have on our website. Um, it shows the watershed up close. It shows some of the topography that surrounds it. I'll show you other uh, views in a minute. Um, this map is in essentially intended to outline the trail itself. Um, as you can see, it starts up basically. Um, the headwaters of the, um, the stream are right up at the city of Gaithersburg, right smack dab in downtown Gaithersburg. Um, and run all the way down to the Potomac. Um, where are we in, in the whole sort of scheme of things? Um, this is a map of Montgomery County. Uh, Montgomery County um, is in Maryland, located just northwest of Washington, D.C. And if you see the little, sort of this little jut out um, on the bottom, that's the northern corner of uh, Washington, D.C. Um, we're a county of 1 million, just shy of 1 million residents, um, the most populous county in uh, Maryland. Um, the southern part of the county, which is in the yellow, the purple, and the orange, is what we call Down County. It's the mostly urbanized. Um, the watersheds there um, have a lot more water quality problems than we do. The northern part of the county, um, so in the blues and the tans, are, um, is what we call Up County, and that's home to the Montgomery County Agricultural Reserve. Um, the Ag Reserve is heralded as one of the best examples of land conservation policies in the country. Um, it's 93,000 acres, almost a third of our county, um, and has more than 500 uh, small family farms. Um, we um, love our Ag Reserve um, and work very hard to um, keep it um, preserved um, and um, as it faces sort of intense and consistent development pressures. You can imagine we are just a half an hour outside of downtown Washington, um, D.C., and there's a lot of pressure um, for development. Um, so the Muddy Branch, here's uh, some pictures of the Muddy Branch. It's a fairly sleepy stream most of the time. Um, you can see the trail on the upper left-hand corner. You can see it supports um, wildlife, it runs through a flooded valley floor, um, and the surrounding forest um, is mostly hardwoods. Um, also supports um, deer, um, lots and lots of woodpeckers, which we love, uh, um, occasional bear, coyotes, foxes, a um, fair amount of wildlife um, can be found um, when you walk the trail. So what's the problem? So here again is a map of Montgomery County and the red circle um, is the Muddy Branch uh, watershed. Um, and you can see that this is a stream conditions report from 2015. Um, the yellow portions are fair, um, green is good, and you can see there's also a little chunk of red um, where there's poor stream conditions. Um, but I think for me, the thing that sort of always strikes me is um, one of the challenges that we face as a nonprofit in looking and working in throughout this watershed is half the watershed is in the city of Gaithersburg and the other half is located in uh, Montgomery County. So um, literally there is a highway that crosses and when you cross that highway, you walk out of the city and into the county. Um, the city um, stream conditions, uh, because it's much more urbanized, um, tend to be worse 
Um, once you get into the county, it, it, there's an actual, the Muddy Branch Park. Um, and so the water quality conditions tend to get better um, as you get out of that urbanized area um, and head downstream towards the Potomac. Um, we have some impairments of chloride and sulfate, which essentially is road salt. That's our, one of our big concerns. Um, we're also impaired for sediment. Um, we do have a lot of problems with sediment loads. Um, the, the rains here tend to be flashy, um, as Doug was talking about. Um, and um, we have sort of the stream, although very often is sleepy, um, carries a lot of sediment load um, throughout, the, throughout the watershed and then down to the Potomac. Uh, nutrients, um, we are impaired for phosphorus, um, but not for nitrogen. Um, here's a picture you can see. This is the um, this is the CNO Railway Canal. So you can see the um, sort of dike um, and the, the the old railway canal that that led up to the Ohio River um, is is right along the back there. Um, and this is the last sort of tunnel that the the river goes through. The, the stream goes through before it hits the Potomac. The Potomac's on the back side of that hill you see in both of those pictures. Um, you can see the water clarity. Um, is a problem um, before um, after um, rainstorms. Um, so we talk about stormwater a lot. I do a lot of work um, trying to mitigate the impacts of stormwater um, in, you know, um, through things, through county efforts to uh, put in green streets, um, to reduce impervious surfaces. Um, and, you know, when you look at a neighborhood like ours, this is not my neighborhood, but it's, it, it's good enough you know, 30 to 40 percent um, of urban areas are, are rooftops, you know, and then there's, of course, um, streets, parking lots, um, school rooftops, municipal building rooftops. Um, it takes up a lot of space and there's a lot of impervious surface um, in these areas. Um, this is a, a Google map of our watershed. And, you know, I think this is probably the easiest place to see in the upper right hand corner. That's where the city is. The um, the stream arises right at the city of Gaithersburg Water Park. You can see a little blue, um, you know, uh, pinpoint um, in the upper right-hand corner. Um, it then goes through uh, very densely populated neighborhoods um, and then heads out into the um, Muddy Branch Park, um, which is um, obviously forested and sort of a much more um, suburban landscape before it enters um, into the Potomac um, at Block, Blockhouse Point Park, which is um, down in the bottom left-hand um, part of the screen. Um, so what are we doing about this? Um, we, you know, we do a lot of efforts, but our, our sort of big program, if you will, is um, the Lands Green Waters Clean Program. Um, so just heading back to spring 2018, um, quickly, um, the Isaac Walton um, League of America launched the Lands Green Waters Clean program in 2012 um, to address everyday pollution um, that most people don't recognize. We all, I think most of the folks on the phone are familiar with non-point pollution. It's runoff from yards and other residential areas. Um, during the league's management of the program, they evaluated um, 67 um, homeowners, yards, um, and installed conservation landscaping at more than at more than 20 homes, um, transforming uh, turf grass into water retaining landscapes. Um, in 2018, uh, the league transferred the Lands Green Waters Clean program over to the Muddy Branch Alliance, um, and we I'll now tell you about some of the things that we've been doing um, to get our homeowners to adopt conservation landscaping practices um, since then. Uh, so Lands Green Waters Clean is the name of the program, um, and essentially what Lands Green Waters Clean does is it supports improved habitat and water quality in our local watersheds um, through community engagement and on the ground, in the ground projects. And um, we really emphasize helping people, homeowners, um, homeowner associations, um, we work with the city to get these um, conservation practices in the ground. Um, and that's where we really count um, our biggest successes. Um, the bread and butter of the program um, originally was the site assessments um, and providing resources. And this is a, a photograph of a site assessment. You can see 
Um, there's a, a home, there's a garage, there's a backyard. Um, and this is sort of one of the initial assessments that gets provided by the Lands Green uh, Waters Clean Program Manager. Um, her name is Lauren Hubbard. You'll, you'll see her picture and hear more about her as, as I go on. Um, and you can see the green areas are areas where um, there's recommended for landscape conservation practices. Um, there are downspouts are marked on, on the home and the garage. Um, and, and rain barrels um, should be put in those places. And so this is the type of um, assessments that we would provide to homeowners. We would then um, help them to identify the types of plants that might be helpful um, and put them in, in touch and, and connect them um, with a professional um, conservation landscape um, consultant um, to implement and actually plant um, these um, these gardens. Um, we get, um, we've received uh, quite a bit of funding um, from the Chesapeake Bay Trust, and so I certainly need to uh, thank them. They've been incredibly supportive. Um, the first year that we took over the program in 2018, um, we received a $5,000 mini grant, um, and that uh, had a lot of workshops, which I'll talk about. Uh, most recently, um, we've just, just this past year, we received um, a $45,000 grant um, to implement a fairly large um, conservation um, garden on the Isaac Walton League um, headquarters property. So what do we do with the money from the Chesapeake Bay Trust? Um, we host a bird, a butterfly bird and bay friendly garden forest. Um, so the city of Gaithersburg is a city of parks and it's a city of trees. Um, and, and I would like to, you know, give a shout out to them there. Um, quite progressive and advanced in the implementation of conservation landscapes. Um, we have a rate, they have a rainscapes program where you can get rebates on your taxes. Uh, I could, that could be not quite right, but you get rebates for um, putting in these um, water friendly um, landscapes. Um, and so um, we had take folks around on these tours um, and show them, you know, how beautiful their gardens can be um, and while also helping to improve water quality. Um, there is a uh, link at the bottom of the page. Um, our butterfly bird and bay friendly garden tour is self-guided at this point and always available. Um, you know, this is actually not a bad time. Uh, quarantine, you know, we're all quarantined. You wanna take a drive around and see some um, gorgeous conservation landscaping. Um, you know, um, this is a good time to do that. So. Uh, click on the link um, and it will it will connect you to um, the various sites that we've got on our tour. And once we've had the tour, um, we realized that folks um, loved the idea but didn't know how to implement it. Um, you know, they just didn't know what to plant and how to plant it and, and you know, and what the proper techniques were. So we started hosting um, butterfly, bird and bay friendly garden workshops. Um, we um, have to, you know, give a shout out to Mary Kay Smith um, in particular. She um, is one of our board members, um, but also leads a group called um, Earth Stewardship East, um, which is an interfaith um, environmental um, group, um, and she's a master gardener. So um, she um, does a lot of work and plants a lot of beautiful um, spaces around our city and county, and I'm very grateful to her. Um, Tony Bailey uh, is a landscape uh, conservation landscape consultant. Uh, Pam Sonneville is a local HOA um, executive director, um, and Brian Smith. And this um, is pictures of one of our workshops in um, that where we um, helped this um, homeowners, homeowners association to um, learn how to <coughs> install a conservation garden. Um, that workshop um, drew um, resulted in a clamor for. Uh, more workshops, and so um, one of the, we sort of wanted to be able to reach more people. Um, so we combined the idea of providing this aerial, these these individual consultations of people's homes, along with uh, design tips, planting selection, um, rainscape information, and other resources. So we would we uh, recent uh, last year held a workshop where um, anybody who signed up, um, our program manager Lauren Hubbard would uh, get an aerial photo of their, their property and have waiting for them at the workshop um, this idea of here's what your property looks like. 
um, and here's um, what we can do to help you. Um, here's an example, um, another conservation garden. Um, we do work very closely with homeowners associations. Um, the idea of working with homeowners associations, the advantage there is that it allows the the whole community, the homeowner, you know, the, the community within the homeowner association to see and appreciate these conservation landscapes and gardens. Um, and it also helps um, to encourage homeowners to do the same thing um, in their own backyard. Um, Woodland Hills um, is one of um, sort of our premier um, efforts to um, work with the homeowners association and install a conservation garden. You, you saw the garden in the previous picture. Uh, we also include um, interpretive signage, um, which educates the community on best practices uh, for clean water landscaping, um, and also um, gives some tips on um, how to keep the environmental, um, keep the environment clean um, and healthy. Um, you know, scoop the poop um, is a big um, motto in Montgomery County. A lot of dogs, a lot of people together. Uh, minimize the use of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Use native plants. Um, you know, don't pour chemicals um, down the drain, um, those sort of things. And so we put these signs out there um, so folks can, as they're enjoying these gardens, um, learn how to do the, the same thing um, in their own backyards. Um, that is me in the picture um, on the right hand side. Lauren Hubbard in the blue shirt is in the um, next to me. She's our program manager. Pam Sonneville is the HOA director. And in the glasses in the back is Michael Wayand. And he is with the city of Gaithersburg, um, and he's been a great partner with us. Um, so we're learning with, as we go, and our most exciting project, um, we um, are about to break ground. Um, it is uh, that $45,000 grant that we got from the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Um, one of the things that we learned as we started planting these conservation landscapes is that maintenance is a problem. Um, they are. Um, there's a lot of labor that's involved in maintaining a healthy conservation a landscape garden or rainscape, rain garden. Um, and so um, we realized that that sort of would prevent, um, would limit us from um, sort of scaling up our efforts to get conservation gardens um, across the, the city um, and the county. And so um, <clears throat> we received a grant for $45,000 to work with the nationally renowned consultant, Larry Weiner. Um, associates to develop low maintenance conservation landscaping and rain garden installation. Um, and we um, are through the planning stages on that. And as I said, we are ready to break ground. We honestly would have, if we hadn't been under quarantine, um, we would have broken ground already. The picture that you see um, with the tree um, is the actual the Isaac Walton League headquarters. Um, and then, of course, there's an aerial um, view at the top. So what's next for us? Um, you know, what we're finding is that these hands-on how-to workshops are um, incredibly successful <coughs> and very popular. And then the other thing is that native plants are hard to come by. Um, they're not easy to find. Um, nurseries don't carry them very always. Lowe's, not going to get them there. And so we're working with um, folks around the state to um, have an actual native plant sale. We're working with uh, the city as partners on that. Um, it, the plant sale actually was to be scheduled for this Saturday. Um, of course, it's been postponed, and we're working on a way to um, figure out if we can, um, how we can do that um, in this sort of new world of um, social uh, social distancing and physical distancing. Um, you can see um, in the bottom. A picture that's Mary Kay Smith, the master gardener I had told you about earlier. And that's um, the day of our tree giveaway. We give away about 500 trees um, every year to locals. And so that was her um, and a customer and one of our um, um, our folks um, coming to get trees um, without um, any sort of physical contact. Um, the picture up in the, the top part of this um, slide is the conservation garden at Pleasant View Historic Site. So that's on a main highway in our street um, and is one of the most beautiful examples that um, we've done so far of um, conservation landscaping. Um, so I'll stop there um, and um, see if there are questions. Um, my information, there's my email 
Um, if you're interested specifically in the Lands Green Waters Clean program, we have a Lands Green Waters Clean email address. <coughs> and then there's our website. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tracy <clears throat> and uh, Muddy Branch Alliance for the presentation and for everything that you guys are doing. I think uh, now we can just kind of, uh, as I'm talking, uh, folks, feel free to continue to submit questions for. Uh, both Doug and Tracy, um, but we're just going to kind of rotate back and forth between the two uh, in, the, in the next nine or ten minutes that we have left. So, Doug, we had somebody um, asking, what are you asking homeowners to do? This is kind of a two-part question. What are you asking homeowners to do to be part of the solution? Uh, and then also, or alternatively, how do you engage them? So, for us, it's uh, really Two, two types of stakeholders. Uh, we're continuing to do a lot of new developments. So we're adding a lot of homes uh, to our community each year. Uh, the focus on that is really to make sure that we get the soil health right through that development process. Um, so trying to get people educated on uh, making sure that the contractors aren't compacting everything so tight uh, making sure that we get organic matter compost um, is the easiest solution to integrate back into those soil structures. Um, we're also then working with those folks as it relates to the required stormwater management practices, the BMPs, whether or not it's the bioswales or the, the rain gardens or, or whatever features are. Uh, so that's mostly the, the new development side. We have a lot of our community, obviously, that it has existed for a long time. Uh, again, a lot of it is, in, in terms of our focus right now, is on that soil health. So uh, helping people with the idea of aeration, uh, compost dressing, converting turf grass spaces to um, native grasses. Again, you can do things that still keep a manicured-ish condition just by converting to uh, fescues or buffalo grass or blue gramas, things of that nature, and, and even those folks that then want to take it a step further and go with more of a native uh, traditional approach. We're working with those folks uh, mostly with technical resources, but uh, trying to put together some uh, tools to help them uh, partner with other organizations. We we dabble a little bit in some of the other spaces, rain barrels and and, and other types of things, but. Um, Right now, um, again, our, our focus is really on that soil health because it's so vast um, and provides such a bang for your buck because we have so much of that sponge available. Great. All right, I'm gonna take one over for Tracy. This is sort of related to um, the question that Doug is answering, but Folks were wondering what your community effort outreach efforts look like um, for your work specifically. So do you use a specific method like social media, newsletters, flyers? Um, and how do you connect with new and different communities when you're looking to work with new folks for the lands green, waters clean? That's a great question. Um, you know, the answer is, is we have a fairly extensive um, communication sort of apparatus. Our vice president um, is also sort of our communications um, expert. So we um, have a newsletter that goes out to 800 folks um, once a month. Um, we have uh, Facebook, Instagram. Um, we actually, even in the program budget for the Lands Green Waters Clean, um, there is a, a, a communications and outreach budget. So we've actually allocated money um, for um, things like um, signage um, and um, mailings and um, and then I think the other big thing is we we use our partners um, we work very closely with a lot of different interfaith groups um, there's we're lucky to have a lot of those around here Shara Torah um, is another one I hadn't mentioned there's the um, interfaith partners of the Chesapeake and then of course Earth Stewardship East um, we work with Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops who are always sort of looking for projects so they're a great um, source of um, sort of word of mouth. Um, and then the city and the county help us to um, get our word out. Our relationship with them um, is very strong. Um, and, you know, if I, 
you know, need something to go out, you know, to the, the city's mailing list or to the county's mailing list, um, we can get make that happen. I think we've probably got time for one more question for each of you. Um, Doug, somebody was asking if uh, there are any programs to implement native plant regeneration in the areas that the goats are eating invasives. Um, it, it, it's actually been really interesting uh, to find that once we do get rid of a lot of the the um, invasive honeysuckle, mostly, once we're able to uh, have that soil get a little more sunlight there is an enormous amount of seed bed already there that's just been hidden um, so that has been one of the the most interesting things is to be able to come back that next year after the uh, the area has been grazed once or twice and this spring uh, we're starting to see some plants that that we had never seen before pop up um, so we haven't at this point really been actively uh, incorporating or adding material we've just been really impressed with uh with with what what is there so if we can just continue to cultivate that a little bit uh, make sure the inputs are right um, we're hopeful that that uh, mother nature will will kind of self-propagate that that are those areas awesome all right so Last question for Tracy, and folks have been asking some specific questions about, you know, lists of native plants that are appropriate for certain areas or um, other nurseries, things like that. So do you have some suggestions of resources where folks can go to find information on things like low maintenance landscaping or, you know, what native plants might be appropriate for their areas, you know, even if they're outside of the Montgomery County area. Do you have sort of a, a, a nice, a couple list of resources or places people can go for that kind of information? So uh, we collectively do. Um, I, I don't, it, that's not my area of expertise. However, Lauren Hubbard, um, who you can reach through that email that was on um, the, um, on the slide deck, um, LGWC, so that's Lands Green, Waters Clean, LGWC at muddybranch.org, um, has all of that information um, and ready to, to get out to folks at a moment's notice. Um, I uh, may warn her that she might get a flood of emails, but um, she's the one who's been collecting all that. It's the type of information that we share um, at our workshops. Um, but absolutely, lists of plants is, is the number one request, where to plant them, you know, um, and then what kind of soils you need, you know, is it sunny, are they, you know, uh, should be near the floor, are they shady, shade loving, sun loving, deer resistance, a big issue around here. Um, you know, so all of that information um, you can get from Lauren um, by sending a quick email to lgwc um, at muddybranch.org. Awesome. All right, well, that about wraps up um, our presentation portion. Thank you so much to both Doug and Tracy for taking the time to share some of this information and we have a few quick notes before we sign off first um, as a reminder this webinar was recorded so you can definitely um, get access to the webinar there will be a follow-up email as well as it will be available on the Isaac Walton League YouTube channel and I hope all of you um, join us for our next webinar so next week Zach is actually going to be presenting about aquatic benthic macroinvertebrates. So some of you might be familiar with our Save Our Streams program, which is our stream monitoring program. And if you've ever wanted to get involved with stream monitoring, but wanted to know a little bit about a little more about what it entails and find out more about these critters that we sample, um, Zach's going to be going through an introduction of these organisms, how we identify them, and um, what they tell us about stream quality. So definitely look out for the link for that. We hope to see you there um, next week. Finally, uh, I wanted to let folks know about uh, one of our program, our other program um, that we're going to be doing re right now. So this is, um, of course, Earth Day. And this week, we're launching our Earth Day Stream Selfie Blitz. So Stream Selfie is um, a program that we have that's a way to get folks outside engaged with their favorite stream and 
also a way to gather information about streams across the US. So all you have to do is head out to your favorite stream, stream or creek, snap a selfie or a picture of the stream and upload it to our national map. And this is going to help us gather information about the waterways all across the country, not just, you know, where do we like to recreate, but also information about, is it a continuously flowing stream? Is it public or private? Is there trash nearby? So we encourage folks over the next eight days to go out, get a picture. We're hoping to get 500 submissions um, just in those eight days. So definitely head out there, get a picture and then check out our monitoring map. We've already gotten um, quite a few in 2020 so far and we've already gotten, I think, six today. So definitely get, uh, get out there and get your stream on our map. All right, well, with that, um, I think we're finished up for today. So thank you again to Tracy and Doug for sharing your information. And if folks have questions, feel free to reach out to us or reach out to Doug or Tracy. And with that, enjoy the rest of your Earth Day. I hope everyone gets a chance to get outside and enjoy uh, what nature has to offer. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you.